Hello, everyone, and welcome to this free virtual seminar session sponsored by Zeiss. My name is Martin Friedrich, and I am an external scientific editor of the Wiley Analytical Science Group. With me here today are three speakers. Welcome to Dr. Cornelia Schweier from the Friedrich Mischer Institute for Biomedical Research, Josefa Schu from Genentech, and Dr. Oliver Fry from Inspiro AG. Cornelia Schweier received her PhD from the Institute of Science and Technology in Klosterneuburg near Vienna in 2019. And she joined Priska Liberalis Lab at the Friedrich Mischer Institute in 2020 to study symmetry breaking in intestinal organoids. Josefa Schu graduated from UC Berkeley with BA in Molecular Cell Biology, Biochemistry. She has been working in Genentech for 18 years on developing multi-parametric high-throughput complex in vitro assays for functional screenings of different drug modalities for oncology and immuno-oncology targets. Oliver Frey holds a PhD in microengineering from the École Polytechnique Fédérale de la Sainte. After working in the Department of Biosystem Science and Engineering at the ETH Zurich, he joined Inspiro, where he is currently Vice President and Head of Technology and Platforms, and leads the Microphysiological Systems and Organ on the Chip programs. Today's session is about advancing 3D culture imaging, gain collaborative insights from academia, biotech, and pharma. The speaker will share their expertise and insights with us on how to overcome the technical hurdles associated with imaging 3D cell culture models, as well as the latest advances in imaging technologies and techniques. They will discuss how these developments are enabling more accurate and detailed imaging of complex 3D structures and how this is leading to new insights and discoveries in the fields such as drug discovery, tissue engineering, and regenerative medicine. Just to let you know, this broadcast will be recorded and available to watch on demand afterwards. After the presentation, our speakers will be there to answer your question. So please use the chance and ask anything you want to know in the chat. Again, I want to thank the sponsor size supporting this virtual seminar. And now I want to hand over to the first speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to this webinar, and I'm very happy to share with you how we use AI-based multi-scale analysis of 3D intestinal organoids to gain insights into tissue patterning. My name is Cornelia Schweier, and I'm a postdoc in Prisca Liberalis Lab at FMI in Basel. So biological organization crosses multiple scales, from molecules to single cells to tissues and up to entire organisms. Cells are here the minimal building blocks of multicellular organisms that can form higher order structures at different biological scales. An example of the formation of higher order structures is tissue patterning. Um, for instance, during early development and embryogenesis, tissues progress from simple to more complex, organized and spatially differentiated forms. Uh, for instance, in vertebrates, somates form sequentially during body axis formation, resulting in the embryonic axis becoming entirely segmented. Or during avian skin morphogenesis, patterns emerge when uniform fields of progenitors diversify their molecular fate and adopt higher order structure. Emergence of patterning is, however, not only important during development, but also during regeneration. And now to study actually the re-emergence of patterning and cell fates during regeneration, we use the intestinal organoid system. Um, why intestinal organoids? because they possess self-organizing capacity, where from a single cell, a fully patterned organoid arises, which actually mimics the in vivo um, cell type composition of the gut, as you can see here. The organoid system is furthermore amenable to large-scale perturbation screening, um, and we can also dynamically track the live cell behavior over several days. Um, now, specifically, what we would like to understand in this project is the first cell fate decision or symmetry breaking event in the intestinal tissue. So here, um, in a uniform growth promoting environment, a single cell divides and gives rise to a symmetrical cyst made up of ident genetically identical cells. This initial phase re recapitulates a regenerative response. 
Then at around 16 cell stage, a subset of cells, sorry, um, uh, start specifying into delta positive cells. These delta positive cells then give rise to the future secretory cells that are important for crypt uh, villus axis patterning. We have previously shown that cell cell heterogeneous activity of the mechanocenter YAP1 is necessary to trigger delta notch lateral inhibition because if, for instance, YAP is homogeneously active, um, symmetry is not broken. So while I showed you that YAP is necessary for symmetry breaking, we also know that it's not sufficient because there's many more YAP positive cells here in the organoid compared to the number of delta positive cells. Uh, which brings me to the main question of this project. Um, how does actually symmetry break and what regulates this tissue scale, uh, spatiotemporal tissue scale decision-making process? Now, in order to address this question, we need to be able to track organoids and single cells in time. So how can we do this? Um, in order to study symmetry breaking um, on a phenotypical and protein level, we singularize um, organoids to uh, single cells via fact sorting, plate them in matrix cell domes and keep them in a growth promoting environment. Then we let them grow out and fix the organoids at different time points in development, immunostain and image them. Um, when I started my project, we already had a high throughput imaging and feature extraction pipeline set up in the lab to extract information up to the organoid level. And we could also then gain information um, on several thousands of organoids. However, to address the question of how symmetry breaks on spatiotemporal level, I needed to add another layer of single cell and single nuclei features. Um, so I started this project by screening for several different cellular state markers, as you can see here. Um, and you can see already that they are differently localized. Some of them are nuclear localized and some of them are localized in the cytoplasm. So this actually asked for um, different uh, ways of segmenting single cells and single nuclei. And therefore, I actually used uh, different machine learning based segmentation tools, such as RDCNet that allows for very good nuclear segmentation or cell posts where we could actually find a great cell segmentation. And here's uh, just to, to show you an example of a single cell segmented organoid. Um, so uh, this now allowed us to actually add another scale to our analysis pipeline. Uh, which is the single cell and single nucleus pipeline, where we can now analyze up to hundreds of thousands of cells and integrate this information with the tissue scale parameters. Um, before I now go to the specifics of the project, I wanted to quickly point out that there's a community effort now to develop new file formats such as OMIZAR and analysis pipelines such as uh, Fractal to handle high content imaging, um, where we as a lab are also contributing to it. Now, with this analysis pipeline in hand, we can use the heterogeneity of the organoid system to our advantage because we can now track the fate bifurcation of organoids that will either break symmetry, and you can see this here in the upper row, so these are in blue, the delta positive cells and the symmetry broken organoids, versus the organoids that will never manage to gain delta and fail in symmetry breaking. We can then extract um, organoid level features such as uh, delta intensity over time, or single cell features, such as the number of the, the positive cells. Um, now applying this approach to uh, the YAP signaling, we can actually see that nuclear YAP signal is higher in the delta positive cells compared to the delta negative cells. Um, further to then functionally test the role of YAP in symmetry breaking, we can perturb YAP signaling, for instance, by uh, YAP inhibition. So here's the case of uh, DAPI, YAP signal, as well as Delta. And in the YAP inhibition, we can see, of, as expected, a reduction in YAP intensity. However, we also see that uh, YAP heterogeneity drops. And this we read out by using in the, a measure of coefficient of variation, so intra-organoid heterogeneity. And this will result in symmetry breaking uh, loss and failure. However, on the other hand, if we then increase, YAP intensity via YAP activation. We can see that a YAP intensity as expected is increased. However, uh, that also results in a drop of coefficient of variation of, of YAP or YAP heterogeneity, and that results in symmetry breaking. So in both cases, you can actually see um, that there is a reduction here in uh, YAP coefficient of variation, showing that YAP heterogeneity is necessary for symmetry breaking. 
Um, next, we of course wanted to understand um, what now regulates this YAP activity in the pathogeneity. Um, so YAP is, no, is a known um, mechanosensor, but also tissue integrity sensor. So one of the measures uh, or the new tissue scale features that we wanted to actually um, check is tissue density, which is defined by the number of uh, nuclei that is um, uh, per epithelial volume. Now, if we um, look at the organoid develop or regeneration in time, we can see that early um, or early organoids actually have lower density, and with the increasing cell number here, uh, the density increases. And this is inversely correlated uh, with YAP intensity, where we see YAP intensity is initially high and then drops over time. Um, so this, uh, this plus also um, more perturbation experiments, we could actually show that YAP indeed senses tissue integrity in our system and is re regulated by tissue integrity uh, and density state. However, you can again see there's multiple YAP positive cells. So at this point, we wanted to understand now which one of these YAP high cells will become the delta positive cells. So in other words, which are now the instructive cues that spatially regulate delta acquisition. <clears throat> and in order to identify now the instructive cues for that uh, transcription, we performed single cell RNA-seq and attack sequencing in the lab. So we first mapped the different uh, cell types in RNA-seq inferred trajectories, uh, showing that initially we have three different reprogramming um, clusters that then uh, fall all in the same uncommitted cell cluster from where they can differentiate with secretory um, stem cells or enterocytes. When we then integrate this with single cell attack sequencing, we can now try to ask the question, which are the transcription factor motifs that actually come up when you go from an uncommitted cell to a secretory cell. Um, and we could actually um, identify one of these transcription, one of the main transcription factors is uh, FOXA1 that could serve as a potential instructive transcription factor for secretory cell fate. Now to test uh, whether FOXA1 indeed precedes delta acquisition, we went back to our image analysis pipeline and could indeed see that FOXA1 actually comes up before delta um, and also, once we have delta coming up, we can stratify again into delta positive and negative cells and see clearly that delta positive cells have much more FOXA1 present. Showing that FOXA1 precedes delta cell emergence, delta cells are always FOXA1 positive, implying a strong regulatory role of FOXA1 on, on delta fate. Um, yes, so with this, uh, we actually... Um, could actually show that FOXA1 might be playing a very important role in data cell fate acquisition. Finally, we wanted to understand how patterning is achieved in intestinal organoids and ask if there's only one cell fate acquisition event. So one event where delta comes up and then this cell keeps on dividing or um, whether there are several delta cell fate acquisition event ha events happening in the same organoid or it's a mix of both. So for, in order to address this question, we had to turn to live imaging. And in the lab, we have previously established a multi-scale light sheet imaging framework where we can track every single cell in the organoid and follow its history. And using now a report aligned for Delta, we can now start to actually track the acquisition of cell fate asymmetry in organoids in time. Taken together, I've showed you today that integrating multimodal uh, data from multiple scales and temporal and spatial scales is a powerful approach to identify mechanistic details of general biological processes such as patterning of intestinal organoids. And using this approach, we could show that YAP senses tissue scale features such as tissue density, which is then integrated on a single cell level to trigger symmetry breaking via delta, delta acquisition. With this, I would like to thank uh, the entire Liberali lab, especially Priska, Sylvia, our collaborators, David Jacob, the computational biology uh, group, uh, Michael, the facilities, IT support, also on the machine learning tools, my funding sources, and you for your attention. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Today, I'll be talking about the development of a 3D high throughput live cell imaging platform for T cell therapy screening. K 
cancer is so complex. Despite all of the research that we have all over the world, cancer is still very hard to treat. Unfortunately, 90% of these cancers exhibit solid tumors. And there's only less than 10% success rate in the clinic, and most of these are for hematological malignancies. So there are different modalities that are being researched to treat cancer, including small molecules such as drugs, biologic therapies such as antibodies, and adoptive cell therapies, which, uh, which is, uh, uses autologous T cells. And this cell therapy is rapidly growing therapies. So today I'll be focusing my talk with this um, treatment. So how does T cell therapy work? So T cell therapies are engineered to target cells and kill them. So here's a schematic on how these uh, engineered T cells are made. First, immune cells are isolated from the patients, then gets activated, and then gets modified. There's different ways to modify the T cells um, to boost its activity, including um, chimeric antigen receptor, as well as engineered TCRs. This modified T cells are then expanded and then reintroduced back to the patients ready to kill the tumor cells. So how these um, T cells work? So here is a mechanism of action of how these T cells work. This T cell, this is a T cell therapy here, and it recognizes the neoantigen that's being presented by the tumor cells. This neoantigen arises from the mutation in the tumor cells and presented in the context of the MHC1. Once this T cells binds to its cognate antigen, it gets activated, uh, releases cytokine and perforin and granzyme B, and then kill the tumor cells. The FDA uh, with cell therapy relies heavily on the in vitro assays to show efficacy as well as safety. However, with uh, human T cells, it does not cross react with a lot of the animal models, including rat and sino for tox studies. And therefore it's very important for us to develop a reliable and validated in vitro assays. But with developing in vitro assays, it comes with a lot of challenges. First is with setting up the assay. Um, as we, the, na the nature of the high throughput screening, we have to deal with a lot of target cells um, with different distinct morphologies. So we have to um, classify these tumor cells and show effect, um, efficacy, and we have to label them with uh, different dyes. Um, and with a high throughput screening, it requires a fast turnaround time. Therefore, we, we need a fast imagers. And with this, we have to sacrifice resolution over speed. The second challenge we have is tracking the activity of the assay. Because with changing spheroid morphology over time with this tumor and T cell co-culture, it's hard to track uh, the tumor cells changing morphology as they die, as well as the T cells when they get activated and move around the wells, their morphologies do change as well. So that's another challenge we have to face. And the third challenge we have is many, meaningfully interpreting the data. As I mentioned, we're working with a low resolution images and with tumor and T cell co-culture uh, changing morphology over time, it's harder to segment between these tumor and T cell cell types. So this challenges here is true in both 2D and 3D assay system, but I wanted to show you the benefit of using 3D um, spheroids. So 3D co-culture models can be better for in vitro efficacy because as we know, 3D spheroids are more physiologically relevant and that mimics human tumor cells. In addition, the tumor microenvironment is also critical for the viability of these many cancer cells. 
Here I'm showing you an example of a cell line that is resistant to 2D assay system. Here we're looking at tumor cell intensity over time, looking at the kinetic traces of cancer cells alone in green and cancer cells plus T cells in yellow in 2D on the left or 3D on the right. So with 3D assay system, uh, the TCR T cells show a faster killing rate before 60 hours time point compared to the 2D assay system where you see killing at 70 hours. In addition, the extent of tumor cell killing with 3D system is much greater uh, compared to 2D system relative to time zero. In addition, the 3D cold culture system can also run longer, similar to a timeline of an in vivo study. And with this, we can then look at the study longer and um, um, look at T-cell exhaustion markers for biomarker analysis. So how do we track this efficacy studies? Um, as I mentioned, we label the tumor cells and there are different options to label tumor cells. First option is looking at nuclei marker, and this uh, marker is ideal kin for kinetics of cell death initiation, which is the early stage of killing. Here, um, we see an example of the antibody-based killing where the antibody tracks, uh, antibody infiltration tracks with tumor killing. The second option is a cytoplasmic marker such as a GFP. And this is ideal for kinetics of cell annihilation, which is the late stage uh, of the killing. This is commonly used uh, for adoptive therapy, uh, especially when it requires modification to the tumor cell, such as including an HLA compatibility. Uh, the third option is using cell membrane dye. And this is ideal as well for cell annihilation. Um, this is faster to establish. However, due to the chemistry of this dye, it stays in, within the tumor cells because of the covalent binding chemistry. And therefore, it's harder to see um, the tumor spheroids as they die. Another way to track efficacy in vitro is using stained T cells. However, stained T cells impact tumor killing. Here, we're looking at tumor cell intensity over different conditions of uh, the T cells. We have unstained, uh, T cell stained with satellite rapid red or cell tracker far red. And we see that with um, these labeled T cells, there is an impact in the unstained, um, impact in the tumor killing compared to the control in black. So I have mentioned um, there's a lot of challenges with cancer uh, labeling, which includes viability of labeling of the cancer cells. Uh, as I mentioned with cell membrane, uh, the retention of the reporter, uh, and also the limited resources for making the stable cell lines such as nuclei marker and cytoplasmic marker is also challenging. And since we're looking at efficacy study, phototoxicity from imaging can also be uh, um, a challenge or difficult for us to evaluate efficacy. So we're pivoting towards using uh, bright field images or face contrast to image spheroids. But with this, uh, we there's a challenge uh, for this as well, including um, different morphologies of the spheroids. Here we're looking at spheroids without a barrier and then spheroids with barrier and spheroids uh, with barrier and plus T cells. And with different morphologies, it will be harder for the analysis um, of these different uh, spheroid morphologies over time. In addition, having, um, because we do have a fast imager, uh, we don't necessarily uh, use a non, uh, an adaptive focus strategy because it takes longer to image each well. So with non-adaptive uh, focus strategy, um, the spheroids or the 2D um, cells over time do change um, and move around the wells. 
So this is another challenge, as well as um, the changing morphology of this uh, tumor cells as they die is another challenge for us for, um, for analysis. So we're using, as a solution, we're using machine learning to improve uh, spheroid uh, segmentation. However, there's some limitation with face contrast images. Um, with the compact spheroid, you can clearly see and isolate the spheroid from the surrounding T um, um, cells that are uh, surrounding the tumor cells. However, with a spheroid that's not form a compact structure, such as these two images here, it requires additional definition, such as looking at uniformity to show loss of the spheroid organization over time. So another way for us to look at efficacy is looking at T-cell infiltration. Um, in here, we're looking at different uh, tumor models, right? In here, we're looking at an inflamed model, and on the right is a desert model. Uh, inflamed model means the T-cell is surrounding the tumor cells, and a deserted model is when T-cells um, are, are not present within the tumor cells. So, and this is actually very important because, um, because there, uh, it represents different patient variabilities as well as uh, different tumor cell types. And with 3D spheroids, we can evaluate this type of different um, models um, in order to uh, further um, analyze them. And the way we're analyzing uh, this uh, T-cell infiltration is also using mas machine learning. In here, we're using um, a machine learning model, and we use the spheroid uh, based on the T-cell, um, uh, labeled T-cells. And with this uh, picture here, we're looking at T-cell infiltration by dividing up the 3D spheroids in different zones and looking at the cell density within those zones of the T cells. So in summary, uh, there are a lot of benefits of using uh, 3D spheroids. First, they're more physiologically relevant systems, which can improve translation in the clinic. And with, um, with 3D spheroids, we can further characterize the T cell phenotypes by looking at exhaustion and activation markers, uh, therefore understanding more of their behavior. And also understanding the tumor cell lines that are resistant in 2D, but are sensitive in 3D spheroids. But we do have a lot of challenges in order to um, develop this and validate this uh, 3D spheroid assay co-cultured with T cells. And these challenges includes uh, the complexity of these um, um, tumor T cell co-cultures, as well as analyzing them to, um, to meaningfully interpret our data. And one of the solutions that we have for all these challenges is incorporating machine learning um, into our uh, assay system. But with this, it with machine learning, it requires a lot of images in order to train the computers. And with that, I would like to acknowledge Kathy Kozak, Danielle Mandikian, and Suyang O oh for their support and guidance uh, for this work. Thank you. Yeah, so good afternoon or good morning, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation for that uh, for that webinar. Um, what I want to do uh, in these 15 minutes is to explain a little bit based on two examples that we have developed at Insfero on what element it takes to kind of advance image-based analysis um, into industrial applications um, at scales. This is work that has been done um, in my group um, at Insfero. Thanks goes to Judy, uh, Özlem, and Frauke that were heavily involved in, in these developments and to a couple of other persons that I will highlight during uh, the presentation. So what we have identified in the past, uh, specifically also Judy, is that we need roughly six elements that need to work hand in hand to <clears throat> provide um, industrial image-based analysis tools and assays <clears throat> for, um, uh, for industrial application. 
The first one, important one, is obviously the 3D cell model that needs to be highly standardized and physiological relevant. And what we have developed that in Sphero over the past are these so-called spherates, multicellular constructs that are made of different cell types. Um, here is um, a liver microtissue of four different cell types um, that has been developed by my partner group, Francisco Verdeguer and Radina, Jesus and, and, and Thomas. Uh, that include lipid droplets, hepatocytes, uh, different extracellular matrices, um, Kupfer cells, uh, and also stellar cells, in order to represent actually the human organ in a in a in a very physiological manner. So we are using these um, spherids, and we are able to produce them in, in a very homogeneous way um, by clearly controlling from where the cells come, doing QC, having automation processes um, in order, and that, that's what you can see on the on the right side, uh, high homogeneity across the plate, uh, but also across different batches. So they have the same size and they have the same function. And one parameter that uh, what is important is the plate format in which we are constructing um, these spherids. And they have a quite a special shape. So we have these spherids that are located in that small little cavity um, at the bottom. And in order to do dosing medium exchanges in a very automated fashion, we have a specifically designed structure in the inside where the pipette tip has a, a contact and a clear position so that we can do medium exchanges in a very reliable way without losing the micro tissues during these medium exchanges. And because I'm, we'll, um, talk about imaging endpoints. This plate is specifically made for imaging. So we have a flat bottom uh, that is very thin and that is matching actually the refractive index of the medium and allows to do imaging at a very high resolution. Um, so I explained the imaging plates that we have, and I will now move into uh, the 3D assays that include on the one hand on how we use those ferrets and how it kind of do fixation, permeabilization, and also the staining to do the imaging um, at the end. So what we are using and what I'm presenting here is the so-called NASH model, which is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And in this liver model, we kind of include the primary cell types that you can see here on the left side, as explained, the uh, hepatocytes, endothelial cells, Cooper cells, and stellate cells into an aggregated spherid. And then we apply different NASH stimuli over a period of 10 days so that this uh, initially healthy state is turned into a, into a disease state so that we can do a phenotypic characterization depending on, on the one hand, the pulses that we apply and specific compounds that we dose um, in parallel uh, to, this, uh, to this induction. And what can be done at the latest stage is that we can look at steatosis, so how lipids are included, inflammation effects, uh, and at the later stage, even the fibrosis, that is the natural um, development of the disease also um, in the human body. And biochemically, we could detect the different biomarkers that stand for these different um, disease um, states. Uh, we can see that the lipids inside the tissues are increasing heavily. We see the cytokines that are coming up through inflammation, and we also see um, fibrotic markers by the secretion um, of collagen 1 that we can even inhibit by using specific um, inhibitors. <clears throat> but what we want to focus today is on steatosis, because this is at the moment um, a spherid wide uh, a, a complete detection of the um, um, of the fats that is included, but what has been seen in in the clinic is that the size of the lipid and how the lipid is included into the cell is um, a very good marker at what state and uh, what severity the disease is is actually progressed. And that's why we went into imaging. And what you can see here on the left side is actually the spherid. And you can all already see that the lipid droplets, the red ones that you can see here on how they have been included are very, have a high variation and analyzing actually the size and the structure of these lipid droplets on how it is included could give us more information on how the, uh, the disease is progressing and how ev um, eventually compounds are interacting with the progression of the disease. 
So we have imaged this um, using a Yokogawa CQ1 system uh, because it has a high throughput, so we can image the whole plate um, very fast. But what you can see is also that it poses some challenges on the analysis because we have differences in the intensity of the lipid droplets. The background is different. Some are more dim, some are more clear. And that gives us challenges on, on how to extract the features of these lipid droplets. And that puts me basically into the other part of the elements that are required. I have shown you the, uh, that our plates are compatible with automation and we have the respective high content imaging platform. But what is important and what I want to stress now is the, the 3D analysis tools that we are using. And the challenges that I have mentioned before is something that we have tackled <clears throat> with an AI-based analysis model method. So we have partnered up with KML Vision, which is a, um, a small startup in Austria. And by doing, um, by using actually the algorithm that you can see here on the left side, going through annotation trainings, checking the performance, uh, doing it again, we were actually able to, in a much better way, segment the lipid droplets in those spherids uh, compared to classical conventional um, threshold-based methods, uh, where in some cases um, we miss kind of the small droplets or large droplets or over-segmented, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> what you can see here on, on, on the top side. And by using this method, <clears throat> we could now apply it onto spherids that have been treated with different kind of stimuli and, and compounds. And what you can see here is on the top side, um, a healthy uh, method where you can see actually the, the images of the lipids that um, are nearly not existent and how they are then segmented. And on the bottom side, the, the high increase of lipids that are in the included and, uh, and the imaging. And more importantly, um, or what is important actually is now to validate this lipid area um, that um, we have detected using the imaging with the previous biochemical assays that we have used. <clears throat> so what we have done is we have co-administrated different um, biochemical or uh, drugs that are inhibiting um, some um, of the, the progression of NASH. And what you can see here is the three glycerides contents uh, of, um, of these different um, differently dosed spherids um, in the system. And what can be seen is that it very nicely correlates with the lipid droplet area that we have detected uh, previously, which is validating, in fact, that we are detecting the same using the imaging as well as um, kind of the biochemical assay, and that we see the same tendency of the compounds that have been co-administrated. But again, this is spherate um, level analysis. Uh, but what is nice, the nice option is that we can really go into more details. And one um, of, the, um, of the approaches that we have taken is to discriminate between microsteatosis, so the small little lipid droplets, and the large lipid droplets that can be seen here um, in these images. And what we can see is that the different compounds actually, similar to what we've seen in vivo, have different effects on how they interact um, with the um, with the progression of the disease. So with some of the compounds, uh, so in the lean version, actually we see a lot of very small droplets um, compared to the large droplets. The DNL model is actually the disease model where we see that the large droplet size are increasing heavily. And in some of the compounds, we see that some of the compounds address actually the large droplets, which is clearly reducing the amount of large droplets, which are the more severe state of the diseases in, in a very efficient way. So just by discriminating small and large droplets, it allows us already to see on how the mechanism is on how these different compounds are acting on our spheroid model. We can even go a step further where we on, not only look at the single parameter, but uh, but much more parameters. Here we have extracted eight, which are some are on spheroid level, but some are on subcellular level by looking at how many lipid droplets are inside, what is the density, what is the intensity of the lipid droplets, and do hierarchical clustering um, direction to phenomics. 
And what is interesting to see and is validating kind of the robustness of the model is that the different replicates that we have of the different drugs that have been admis, um, administrated are um, clustering um, in a similar way. So the different replicates that we have are behaving exactly in the same way that allows us now using this clustering method to differentiate um, between the different compounds in a more detailed um, and, and, and more exact way um, as if you would only look at a spherid level um, analysis. So this is kind of showing a little bit the performance that we now have and the analysis and the kind of differentiation of action of compounds on mechanistics um, in the progression of the, of, of the NASH or kind of, of, of this disease in, in this specific um, spheroid model that we have developed. I would like to go now into another model that we have also developed with this, with this the islet, so the pancreatic islet model, which is also kind of a multicellular construct, which is composed of different cells, like the alpha cells that are secreting insulin, the beta cells, and the delta cells. This is work that has been done um, in the group of Burjak Yezeldak together with Alex, Felix, Chantal, et cetera, um, that have developed basically these assays to a point that it can be fully applied um, in, in this industrial applications and services to detect actually the progression and the proliferation of a specific cell type. Very similarly, we are using an aggregation method uh, where we first isolate the islets, dissociate and re-aggregate them into very uniform um, sized islets that are produced in a 96 or in a 384 well format. And they are also quite long, have a good longevity, which means that their functionality is preserved over at least four weeks. And this is now the model that we can use for the specific assay that has been published actually um, recently the beta cell proliferation assay, which um, is kind of an important parameter that is looked at into in diabetes research. So as I said, we do the islet production and then we have a compound treatment that is done over 21 days. And in the last four days, we do an EDU treatment that is able kind of to detect the proliferating cells because the goal is actually to understand of what are the compounds that eventually lead to a proliferation of the insulin secreting beta cells that could possibly be, be a, a treatment for diabetes uh, for diabetes patients and what we have what you're doing is on the one hand the functional assessment but then also the 3d imaging assessment to understand how many of these beta cells are actually really proliferating and that's actually the assay that i want to jump into it a very important point here is that the proliferating cells are a very small population that you can see on the on the right side. So you see all cells, you see the beta cells that are the insulin cells and the proliferating beta cells that are here on, on the right side. And since it's a very small fraction, we really need to look at the complete islet. So it needs clearing and it needs an imaging through the whole tissue structures. And what we are then doing is first we do the, the nuclei detection uh, using DARPI. Um, we do the beta cell detection using NKX6.1 uh, 6 positive cells. Um, we look at the proliferating cells, plan of all cells. And in order to detect the proliferating beta cells, we do a co-localization of the two last markers. <clears throat> what you can see here now is a scan or basically a stack through the complete image um, of, um, of the islet with every single cell on how it has on the one hand be detected and how it has been in quantified. And you see on the left side, the DMSO control and on the right side, the harming control, which is a compound that is known to induce proliferation of cells. And based on that proliferation detection assay, we can now quantify actually the number of cells on the lower side or all cells that are proliferating and the beta cells that are proliferating in independence of a specific compound that has been administrated. In comparison, obviously, to all cell counts, which kind of show that we have a, a very constant um, cell population and some of them are, are proliferating. So with such kind of an assay, we see on what it takes of all the six different elements that I just shown before. Um, 
of the model that it uses, the platform that it uses, the analytical tools that it needs to, in the end, create a quantitative graph that allows us to discriminate on what compounds have a specific effect on uh, a proliferation and a potential um, way uh, to address a specific uh, disease type. So with this, I would like to thank all uh, the people that have been involved in these different studies. Uh, it's a very cross um, cross in sphero um, uh, development that we have done there uh, and you for your attention. So many thanks to our speakers, Cornelia, Josef, and Olivier for the very interesting presentations. And now let's open the Q&A session. We have already a few questions in the chat, but I would like to encourage the audience once again to ask questions in the chat. In case we don't have time to get all of your question, to all of your questions, don't worry, our speakers will contact you by email with answers when available. And now turn to the first question. And the first question is to Olivier. Um, can you elaborate the plate features to understand mm -hmm. how it works? Um, yes, um, I mean, I have explained it a little bit um, in the in the talk. So we have engineered the plate specifically for spheroid cultures and spheroid cultures in general are so the spheroids are not anchored in the plate. So if you do medium exchanges and if you handle, um, there is the risk that you pick them up um, faultly and then you can, if you lose them, if specifically if you do multiple medium exchanges. And ideally you also want to have a full medium exchange to have a precise dosing. Otherwise waste products, et cetera, might remain in the tissue. So that's why we have this special shape that I have shown, which is a little bit of cone-like structure. And the cone-like structures that enables you kind of to have a specific position of your pipette tip so that you can remove easily all the liquid while a very small remnant volume remains at the very bottom so that the spheroid is always in liquid, but that you don't risk to accidentally uh, pick it up. Um, additionally, it's just like a one millimeter diameter um, sized uh, at the bottom. Um, it is flat. So you will easily find your tissue because it's located in that one diameter, so the one millimeter diameter, and it's flat, so that allows you to do the high content, high content imaging. Okay, thank you. And there's another one for you. Are you working with cell lines or primary cells? And um, for some tumor cells, we have used cell lines, but the two models that I have um, that I have shown here are uh, are primary cells, so they come from uh, specific donors. And um, so they are aggregated, so they're dissociated first for the islet model. And um, all cells come from the same donor and they're assembled again in the same ratios, what we can show in experiments and stainings. And for the liver cells, they are um, originating from different donors, are unselected in a, way, in a way that they match well and that they re retain their function. But all are, in these models were primary, uh, primary human cells. So the next question, and I'm not sure to which is it addressed. Has anyone used PI to label the necrotic core and of a spheroid uh, at which concentration and for how long? Sorry? Did you I get PI before, but there are ways to, um, I know it's, um, you're looking at the chronic core. I haven't used PI, but um, I'm planning to use um, hook dye, but that's looking at uh, live cells um, for the, yeah, for the spheroids. Okay, thank you, Josefa. And yeah, we, hi, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, as well, kind of, we, we used some PI, but I, I don't know the concentrations and the time of incubation, right? So in general, we, the models that we use are sized in a way that there isn't any necrotic core for the islet and the liver model. Okay. 
Um, there's another one for Cornelia. Could you please elaborate more on the image analysis and nuclei volume measurements pipeline for the 3D structures? Is it possible to replicate uh, this pipeline in our lab or in another lab, let's say? Thanks for the question. Um, yes, so um, exactly. So on the image analysis and nuclear volume measurement. So um, first, what we do, we um, first segment organoids on a whole tissue scale. And then once we kind of reach and extract these organoids. So then the next step was for us to find really a good segmentation of our nuclei and cells. Um, so for nuclei, we used RDCNet based uh, machine learning tools. Um, which are also um, available. So yes, this is all accessible. Um, then for cells, it was a bit more tricky. We used cell posts, but all of these models we had to train with our organoid data in order to really improve the performance. So I think it could definitely also work. I mean, I don't know what the person who wrote this question, you know, what the person is working on, but I would suggest to um, definitely try, um, if you're interested in nuclear segmentation, try different um, architectures such as RDCNet or UNet that is uh, used in cell posts and then train on top with your specific data. At least this is how it worked very well in my case that we started with a basic model and then we train it on top or we train a model from scratch. Um, and then um, the other question was, uh, so the nuclear volume measurement, exactly. So once we have a good segmentation, we go to the, to the feature extraction pipeline. So for us, it's all um, automated because we deal with high numbers. So in a way we used um, custom-made Python pipeline so that um, we also have in a lab. And it's also, I mean, once it's all published, it will be also available. And there's also this um, open source and community effort now, it's called so-called Fractal, that will also implement a lot of uh, these steps. Um, so for the 3D volume, maybe just one more thing, I use Scikit image package. So um, that is also available online open source. Um, yes. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you. And now a question I think addressed to uh, you all of all of us, uh, all of you. Um, um, what optics do you use to minimize loss of image quality and resolution as you image deep into, into the structures? Would like to start with answering this question. Josefa, would you like? Uh, I, in my talk, I, I actually, because we're trying to, um, this is a high throughput screening. So we do our live cell imaging using um, Incusite. So we basically are not doing confocal microscope at this time, but I am planning to use it um, as I'm developing this um, um, uh, high throughput screening uh, with regard, yeah. So right now we're only doing um, a 10X resolution for our image-based assays. So the others like to comment on this, Olivia? Yeah, so on our end, we're using a, a 20X and a 40X, um, try to go as high as possible with DNA. Um, uh, of course, if you're gonna go deep into the structure, um, you need to think about your working distance. Um, due to the fact that you're a very thin membrane, um, you can go quite high, so you can use working distances or like objectives of 300 micron and you still have the whole sphere that is within your stack, um, that's that's an advantage. Um, yeah, and we clear it. So we clear tissues. Um, for the eyelid micro tissues, they're completely cleared. The liver micro tissues are a little bit more challenging um, because they have uh, a lot of um, extracellular matrix structures, proteins that are difficult to clear. And we need clearing agents that are not Removing the lipids, that is kind of the challenge. So many of the clearing agents are actually uh, remove the lipids, but if this is kind of the market we want to test, it's uh, not ideal. Vanelia, would you also like to comment on this? Um, yeah, I think most important um, points have been mentioned already. The clearing, like for I'm personally working on rather small structures, so they're I don't know, most of them are like below 50 micrometer, but one day also sometimes up to 100. And then we also use clearing. Um, and I usually, 
so because I, I really need high resolution for all the nuclear and single cell um, analysis, I use usually 40x. And but it's a spinning disk, uh, Yokogawa high throughput imaging setup. Okay, then the next question: Do you always clear spheres for imaging? Is answered with this, or Josefa, would you like to comment on this? At this time, I'm not using that, but um, we have um, set up that protocol in our lab. But um, for my high throughput screening, we're not using clear at this time. Because normally we just wanted to look at the spheroid shrinkage over time, if it's dying or not. Yes. Okay. And the next question, when live imaging 3D organoid spheroids what is preferred maximum organoid spheroid size limit that can be imaged in high resolution regarding the work distance of microscope? I mean, this is what I mentioned before. Um, there are some high resolution objectives that have just a 300 micrometer um, working distance, um, the high NA ones, even if you have kind of a water immersion or oil immersion um, objectives, then if you have a bottom that is 180 microns, then you have another 120 to image, right? So um, that's why um, you have to think about the bottom thickness and where your sphere is, is located. Otherwise, you need to go to higher working distance. So this is kind of the, the trade-off that you have to do. Other comments from the speakers? Not the case. Um, Olivia, um, there's another one for you. Um, which pipeline? Okay, I have to go a little further to the screen. Which pipeline do you use for analysis for a, a set stack images? Um, so, in the two use cases, the first use case was the liver. This was actually segmented on maximum intensity projections. Um, we used that method because we didn't clear the tissue. And it, even though it's kind of a, a MIP, it gave us um, quite good results. Uh, for the islets, what we used, and that's the KML pipeline that we have used, um, that has been established internally, kind of based on the platform that has been provided by KML Vision. Um, and for the uh, for the islets, that's an internal pipeline that we have developed with um, Cell Pathfinder, which is the software, um, the analytical software that goes uh, for, for Yokogawa, actually, that goes with the uh, CQ1. Okay, and to go through, because we have only three minutes left, the next one, hi. Was anyone able to image the spheroids center without segmentation? Not sure what I don't know if the others. Um, I, I'm not sure what is mentioned here. So we were able to image the center of the mm -hmm. islets. I mean, you could see a stack completely through the tissue, but I think this is somewhat independent of segmentation, right? Um, segmentation is just a follow up process that you do based on the images. Okay, the next one is addressed to Cornelia. What is the microscope? Sorry. Um, what is what is the microscope that you for your spirit uh, imaging, and is this commercial or home built system? So we are using a commercially available uh, Yokogawa, and most of the data I showed you was with CV seven thousand. There's also now CV eight thousand. So these are these are usually the ones that we use for high throughput imaging, and come along with twenty uh, x, forty x, sixty x. But for the data that I showed you, I used the 40x. Okay. Uh, and maybe one more um, addition to the previous question. So I'm also happy to give more information on the, um, I don't know, uh, analysis pipeline. So you can just drop me an email on the person with the question on the nuclear volume. Okay. And because of time is running out, we have one last question for Josefa. What is the most challenging part of the 3D spheroids in live tumor and T cell co-culture? Um, I would say the most challenging part is really the analysis, just because as I mentioned, um, 
we are really going for the speed and therefore we have uh, very low resolution images. But um, in order to validate this, uh, I am using confocal microscope as well uh, to, to make sure that um, we wanted to understand that this spheroid um, shrinking over time with this treatment is actually um, a dying tumor cell. So that's one of the um, the most challenging part of our of our assay. Okay, time is up now. Sorry, <laughs> we have to conclude the webinar. Um, but don't worry, our speakers will contact you by email with answer when available. We will transfer or we will um, um, forward all of your questions to the speakers and um, you will receive your answer you need. Um, yes, time is up. We have to conclude the webinar. Thank you very much for all again for attending. Thanks for thanks again for uh, for the nice presentation to our speakers and for joining us. And we thank the sponsor size and very much thank you for all watching this webinar. Have a nice day and I say goodbye.